Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to another session in our Women Lead online forums that are brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas. I'm your host today. And today we are in the ladies room. You know, that place where women talk about things that we might not say just anywhere. Things that we can only say to one another because well, because we all have shared experiences. So this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, and come away hopefully with some new ideas or validation. In the ladies' room, we go there. So our session today lasts for an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. If you have something you'd like to ask anonymously, you can just put it in the chat window to me and I'll share it for you. So our topic today in the ladies room is, can we still talk about diversity? So I want to introduce my great uh, panel of special guests that I have with me. First, I'm going to start uh, by introducing you to Tracy Ward. Tracy is the founder and president of Forward Talent Strategies, Inc., a consulting firm that is passionate about partnering with businesses to strengthen their HR strategy and practices and cultivate a strong company culture. By building programs to attract, engage, and retain key talent, they enable companies to achieve profitable growth and bottom line objectives. So welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Rebecca Johansson, and she specializes in creating active learning environments based on techniques used in the theater to create opportunities to not only learn the latest in organizational theory, but to put it into practice. She's been working in the field of emotional intelligence, collaboration, creativity, and gender equality, as well as working as a public speaking coach for nearly 10 years. She holds a PhD in drama from the University of California, Irvine, with an emphasis on feminist criticism. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for joining. Thank you. And finally, we have Tiffany Jamison, who is the founder and managing partner for Grit and Flow. I love the name of that company. She is a highly passionate leader with her sights set on changing the employment landscape to be one of inclusivity, where every employee has the opportunity to reach their full potential. Through a researcher practitioner model of business management, change management, and organizational psychology, solutions are delivered through extensive research research and proven best practices. So welcome, Tiffany, and thanks to all of you for joining me today. I'm looking forward to a very rich conversation today. So let's kick this off by just asking maybe what, what got you interested in the area of, of diversity and inclusion or diversity or inclusion or all of the above. Uh, whoever wants to go first, just jump right in. Mine's pretty simple. I, I, um, oh. <laughs> I jumped. <laughs> I was just gonna say, mine's simple. I um, I have a son with autism, and um, when I was finishing up my PH, uh, my MBA, sorry, I realized um, doing my capstone that there was an 85% unemployment rate for people with autism, wow. um, and the rate for people with autism that have college degrees, which is the track my son is on, is even higher, and it, it just wow. really stopped me in my tracks. Um, and after doing further research, I realized there were no solutions for how we were going to solve this huge problem that we were having. Um, and we have 70,000 kids or young adults entering the workforce every year that have autism in the United States. So with that in mind, I, I tried to find out how we can make solutions and I realized there weren't any, as I was saying. So I'm getting my PhD in organizational psychology, trying to do the research and connect with the community to find these solutions so we can communicate them and make them more standard practices and best practices. Oh, great, great. Tracy, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to mention um, when I was a young child, I had a situation where, you know, it was kind of an ugly situation where someone had told my mother, why don't you go back to where you came from? And for someone to be uh, treated that way just because of their ethnicity was really shocking to me. And it's also a reason that um, I've always looked to be inclusive and to appreciate people for who they are and not treat people differently because of the position that they're in 
or the level of role that they're in within a company. I think you, you just need to show respect regardless of where they're at. And um, I think also when in the HR role, you, you typically are in charge of the hiring practices and looking for a diverse pool of candidates. And I would often find that I wasn't able to find a lot of female candidates for certain positions. Mm -hmm. And so it was learning to be very intentional about how we were mining candidates and also tapping individuals within the organization to say, you should apply for this um, opportunity and really encouraging internal mobility. So um, being able to make a difference in that way was really rewarding, but I do think that we need to make a conscious effort to take some of those steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Rebecca, how about you? Uh, well, I was raised by an incredibly strong-willed and um, amazing single mother. And uh, she had a very significant impact on the way that I walked through the world. And uh, you mentioned my, my bio in the beginning. My background is in the theater. And when I was applying to my PhD programs in theater, I kept getting asked the question, well, what critical lens do you want to study? Do you want to pursue looking at theater through? And I had no idea what they were talking about at the time. <laughs> and I realized as I did my work in, and I very fortunately got into a program without having that defined um, because they wanted me to find it along the way. And uh, what I found as I was going through is that I have always been drawn to the female characters uh, in plays and I, I don't particularly care for some very popular plays because I don't think they have very interesting female characters in them at all, <laughs> Hamlet. Um, but uh, so that led me a little bit more toward, um, toward taking a look at this very specific academic track of looking at um, feminist critical approaches to looking at, um, my, in my areas, uh, dramatic literature, but also to history. And so when I finished school, I ended up getting a position at NYU uh, in the theater department there teaching um, dramatic literature and theater history. And they wanted me to specifically teach it from that point of view. So over the course of the, the five years that I taught there, um, I got the opportunity to, to make the connection for the students between the way women were treated historically and the way that they are treated today. Uh, and I would see the light bulbs going off in, in all of my 18 to 22 year old students, which was fantastic to see that, that their eyes were being open to, to the sort of systemic issues that we have culturally about gender. Um, but that also lent itself toward talking about um, all different kinds of marginalized groups and, and, and looking at them historically as well. Right. Uh, and then when I, when I made the transition out of academia and was doing all this work in the, in the world of corporate training, um, I thought, I realized that I wanted my um, middle age and older uh, clients to have that same experience of an aha moment of, Oh, I didn't even realize that this is, you know, it's not the way that I'm personally acting uh, it's something that I've been taught that that I've been so surrounded by through the society that I've been raised in mm -hmm. um, that I was completely blind to the fact that that I was treating people this particular way. Yeah. Um, so I've really enjoyed making that transition from um, having that aha moment with my my twenty something teen something students to now working with um, people who are making major decisions at, at organizations around the country. Yeah. You know, I uh, have always found it interesting um, that we look at a problem that exists today. You know, so we say that we need uh, more diversity in the workplace or we need more women in certain roles or we, we need more minorities in this or that or, you know, whatever the, the, the end result thing looks like without going back to the very um, – beginning the very root of why is it that way and and Tracy something you said um, really kind of triggered a, a thought to me that you can't hire a diverse work group if you don't have diverse candidates and you can't have diverse candidates if you don't have a diverse recruiting mindset and you can't have a diverse recruiting mindset if you don't see the value of having a diverse workplace to begin with you know so if a company is just doing lip service to this, and we've all seen those places that, that that's exactly what they're doing, uh, 
that's not going to that's not going to have any impact because all of those systemic things are not going to be addressed or or looked at or or considered. So have is that what you guys have found as well in your experience or what what have you seen companies possibly doing to try to get around that? We see a lot with the um, field of neurodiversity or autism disabilities. It's had as you know Rebecca talked about it's had such a history of coming in of having different models where people with disabilities were seen as somebody you need to put down, you know, and then it got into more of, um, oh, those poor people to now uh, kind of more of an engagement or empowerment uh, of these groups. So it has a, it has a story that goes with it. And I think that's important to know that that's kind of how a lot of people, depending on, you know, your workforces you're working with, that's what they've been raised with. So now that we have a huge aging population, you know, the individuals in those groups are not used to seeing, you know, women or people uh, with disabilities or autism as equals. They're used to seeing them as less than because that's the way their norms are, which gets a lot to what, you know, Rebecca was talking about. Um, so my, I, I think it's, it's completely what you are. But I think that also was a good thing. Like Tracy brought up the part about, you know, not really having an um, opinion of people, not in a bad opinion, but just you accept people for who they are. You don't look back and, and criticize. And I, I define myself the same way, but at a social injustice conference I was at, it was interesting for them to really pick that apart and saying that I was colorblind. And they said that me being colorblind and being so accepting is I wasn't really taking into account the uh, diversity that women or diversity of an ethnic group had had to go through to get to where they're at. And by being colorblind in that way, I wasn't really giving them credit for the struggles and maybe the privileges I've had, which really made me look at the problem differently. I don't know if I have a solution yet, but mm -hmm. I, I do think all that really comes into play about how we're looking at these within the, the workplaces and why it's such a hard issue um, to move forward on a lot of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I work with um, I, I I work with some organizations um, on. I've just been starting to do this specific work with some some groups that bring me in because. And the great the great thing is is that the the men who participate so far in these groups are men who who understand and um, they know that there's a problem. They know they need to do something about it. They they are strong allies to their to their female colleagues, but they don't really know where to begin uh, with with. Yeah. where it comes from or how to fix it. And they, part of what I do is to create a space where they can have uh, safe conversations and open conversations to share those experiences and give them an opportunity to put themselves in, in another person's shoes. Um, and then once we have those conversations, then we sit down and we get to the very real work of, okay, what do we do about it now? Mm -hmm. Like I just did a brainstorming session with a group uh, up in San Francisco a few weeks ago where one of the, the, the things that we had a small group brainstorming is how do we recruit a more diverse um, pool of candidates? Like what specific policies can we put into place? Um, so it's like this balance between both getting, getting your employees on board and behind it and engaged and understanding why it's important, but then also implementing organizational policies to make sure that, um, that you have all the resources that you need to be able to do the things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How do you, I would agree that, oh, I was going to say, um, you know, one of the things is with regards to providing tools it's really important that you're able to help facilitate and make things easy, especially for hiring managers. A lot of times they're thinking it's gonna cost more money if I have to buy certain equipment for someone to be able to function, or if there are certain things that might take a little bit longer because they might need to have something translated for someone that's hearing impaired or you know a different situation. And when you show them, though, the long-term benefit of having a productive, loyal employee and how easy it is to find someone that can do sign language for a meeting or utilizing technology so that you can, you know, send um, different requests out for work that needs to be done for someone who's hearing impaired. Those are things that, you know, as an HR professional, we're able to help facilitate and educate and be able to then um, show them the pathway to help create a more diverse workforce. 
Yeah, I agree completely. It's just all in the education. There's just so much education that needs to go on. It's hard to figure out, you know, with the diversity efforts. I mean, you look at the three of us and we all approach it differently. And I think one of my concerns is seeing companies look at diversity as uh, color and gender and missing all these other pieces. And so now that it's such an important part of what companies are looking at in culture, if they're putting all this money and effort and they do it wrong, what's the ramifications going to be? And that's really what keeps me up at night is, whoa, stop everybody. Let's do this right if we're going to do it. Um, you know, so I'm glad you guys are doing your efforts, but I, I really think we need, need to come together more um, and look at it as a bigger picture. Um, but your approach, Tracy, I completely agree with. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, maybe pushback or discomfort do you get when you go into a company and you begin to talk about some of these things? Um, it, one of the classes that I teach, it's a very simple thing. I, I show a slide that you know, has a picture of a middle-aged white man next to a probably millennial tattooed, you know, young woman. And then I say, who would you want to hire as your next boss? And that, you know, first nobody wants to talk because nobody wants to say, you know, somebody is sitting there thinking, well, I sure don't want that tattooed chick. You know, I, I want the experienced old white guy. And, but nobody wants to say that. And so you, you have to kind of open it up and get people to be willing to say what's really on their mind so that you can, ex uh, I guess, investigate why is that, where, where do those kinds of bias come from, how deeply rooted are they, and so forth. So do you, do you get that kind of pushback when you go into a company and you're working with them, and what do you do to try to overcome that? I don't want to jump in. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I do. Um, one of the things that I like to, to think that I um, do very well as a facilitator is, is to set up an environment where, um, where we can explore those kinds of experiences and those kinds of, of, of things um, from a very, I try to set up a very objective um, space and, and maybe start off by addressing those kinds of biases or, or looking at where those biases come from before we engage in the conversation. Um, I do a whole um, piece about um, biological difference between men and women. And, uh, and it's very objective, it's scientific, it just looks at some of the new work that's being done on just purely how our brains process information differently from one another because we've got um, different segments of our brains that are, um, that are functioning at, at cross purposes to, to each other. And um, we talk very humorously about how that leads to a lot of the common um, stereotypes about men and women in the workplace. Um, and, but then we break it down into a very real space of, no, biologically, this is what's happening that's creating these stereotypes that we have. How, now that we know that it's not just an opinion of how we feel about each other, it's actually how we process information and communicate differently, how can we take advantage of that? So that's how I frame the conversation, is um, this is just a, a, a fact of biology of how we are different. Um, now, how can we use that to our, how can we see that as an advantage to our organization rather than um, talking through all of the anger that we've got over the miscommunication that's happened in the past? So I try and approach it from that point of view of, of knowing that those objections are there, knowing that those biases are going to be there in the room, um, talking about where those biases come from. Uh, and, and thinking of, of it as an opportunity to move forward and create, um, at the same time, create an opportunity to, to talk about shared experience. Um, so, so far, I've only really been working in, um, in teams with men that already have a baseline of understanding, <laughs> um, which I feel very grateful that there are so many men that do have a baseline of understanding, um, and, and there's some fantastic allies out there, but even the allies uh, are shocked when, when they come to um, a, a new piece of information about women's experience that they, that they didn't know. Like, I do a whole piece on, on the difference between what the words yes and no mean to men and women. 
uh, what it means when a man hears yes from a woman versus what she might actually mean when she says yes. And, um, and that opened up a door for like about a half an hour of, of women sharing their experiences of not feeling like they could say no. Um, and why. And um, so I, I like to think of, of creating a space where um, everybody feels uh, that they can share, that they're not going to be attacked for, for their, what they share or, or how they've thought about the world in the past. Um, I, I always, my years of, of university teaching come into play of setting the tone at the very beginning that this is not an opportunity to yell at one another to get angry over past injustices. This is an opportunity to think about how we're gonna move, move forward um, with new information that we now have about each other and creating a space for empathy. Um, because I think all, all, all inclusion efforts start from helping people to create a space for empathy with one another and to be able to put themselves in another person's shoes and see their point of view. Um, and then I think that they're much more willing to, to have an open and understanding conversation uh, with one another about what their real problems are and, and how they can work towards solutions. Yeah, my experiences are very similar um, when you're talking about disabilities and autism. Um, it is sitting in that safe spot. So when I do trainings like autism at work, what's it look like? Um, I really try to set, there's no wrong way for the next hour and a half to talk about disability and autism. There's no correct words to use. There's no, because um, with the, this field, um, there's a lot of um, uncomfortableness for people. Because they've always felt like, you know, that person's under, uh, uh, you know, under privilege or some way, or, or they need to, you know, walk around with, with little, um, you know, cushions around them and baby them, but that's really not the case. So a lot of it begins with um, understanding where they're at. And I've had people say, oh, I have one of those. We have one of those. We got that guy, Mark, and and so and so, or oh yeah, we have our autistic person. He's great. He can fold stuff. I mean, I have had people say that to me. Um, so that's kind of my first thing is is I got one of those, and I'm like, we got to get a lot more of those in here. And have you really thought about how they can you know provide a service to you? So a lot of that's um, looking at the problem, or I look at the audience in in, in a different little different way than um, Rebecca has to, but. I have to look at, okay, do I need to approach this from a value proposition? What's the proposition, like Tracy talked about, of hiring this employee with autism? You know, these are what we know about them. How much do accommodations cost? You know, the average accommodation is under $50. You know, what do these look like? What are your legal obligations? How do you do education? You have to educate the line manager. How much is that going to take? You know, and really um, breaking down that whole piece there. But there's also, you can look at it from a social responsibility piece where people just want to feel good about what they're doing. So sometimes you have to approach it from that angle. Um, so it's, it's challenging. You do have to fill out what is important to the group to get them to see the whole picture um, and, and really drill down on that one area because, you know, once again, everybody's just so uncomfortable talking about it. Um, and, you know, you want to not be judgmental of the language they're using and you want to teach them the right language, but you need to kind of figure out where they're at. So you like, uh, Rebecca said, you need that safe spot where everybody can kind of, you know, diary of the mouth and say everything they need to say, and then you can go through it and sort through it to make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I would add, I mean, it's amazing when you can go into organizations that have enlightened leadership and be able to focus on strategies that they've already identified that they want to work on. But in other cases, it's really looking at um, how can you put things in, a biz in business terms or in a way that makes sense and relates to their own business. So for example, if there's a hot button and something's important to them, such as culture or their employer brand, then that's perhaps a way to approach the diversity aspect. Um, as an example, if it's a customer service organization, showing them that their customers are going to question if the employee base, that population is not diverse and doesn't reflect some of their customer base. So if they actually employ a diverse pool, then that's going to be more reflective of who they're serving. And I think that's going to benefit the organization as a whole because people will appreciate that and relate to that, especially if they speak different languages, you know, et cetera. So um, I think approaching it that way, and then also even from a communication standpoint, because 
a lot of times communication is the, the number one issue in an organization. And it's, you know, a multitude of things. The, the interpersonal, it could be the verbal, the body language. Mm -hmm. So how are they communicating in a way where yes does mean yes or understanding what does yes actually mean? Mm -hmm. And then working from that perspective to share how you can actually be um, appreciative of individual um, perspectives and expand the conversation from there. Yeah. You know, Tracy, I want to go back for um, just a minute kind of to some basics. Um, what is the difference between diversity and inclusion? Because they get lumped together, you know, it's kind of like PR and marketing, mm -hmm. you know, we say <laughs> diversity and inclusion. What, but there is a difference between the two, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. I mean, I heard this quote that diversity is being asked to the dance and inclusion is being actually asked to dance. Um, and so I think diversity, a lot of people think of it as your metrics or EEO numbers. Um, what is the population representative of if you break it down into statistics? And inclusion is a little more emotional. It's how, do, it's how do people feel in the organization itself? Do they feel that they are valued and heard and involved? Um, to me, I mean, the goal really is inclusion because you want to, to make sure that it's not just something on paper because on paper doesn't translate into actual um, impact on the individuals and impact on the business itself when you're truly involving people and respecting the perspectives and insights they each bring um, that's where you really see um, amazing things happen you see that safety in being able to share your opinion and know that that's going to be respected and valued and the collaboration increases and the ability for the organization to um, expand their reach, um, it, it can be exponential. Yeah, those are great, great definitions. Thank you. Um, a while back, I was teaching, uh, they were calling it diversity training, but it was really sexual harassment training and how to not get the company into trouble training for a, a, a kind of a blue collar type of organization and uh, it was right after Harvey Weinstein everybody was talking about it you know so everybody wanted to protect themselves and so forth and um, they, they didn't have a very diverse workplace but um, but there had been a few issues and you know I this one gentleman just said you know what now thanks to this guy you know and everything that he did now we, we can't even do anything so I'm just not gonna ever talk to women anymore I'm not gonna you know touch a woman I'm not gonna shake her hand I'm not gonna do anything like that anymore. I'm just going to hands off. So what have you three seen out there among your clients and out there in the workforce that's been ushered in by the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement, the Harvey Weinsteins, the Jeffrey Epsteins of the world, all of, I, oh, well, let's not even go there. That's <laughs> for us to even talk about. But, <laughs> but yeah. all of those other things, what, what are you seeing out in the workplace? Um, well, I'm, I'm seeing what I've seen initially is a lot of pushback with a lot of um, men who um, are in positions of power that are now afraid that they, they don't know what the rules are. So, uh, so they're afraid. I mean, it's not that they don't know what the rules are. It's that they're afraid of perception. Mm -hmm. So they, um, they now are not taking, uh, they're not allowing to, they're not creating mentoring opportunities to mentor younger women within the organization. They don't, so I've heard some stories of men not even wanting to go out to lunch or be in an elevator with a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and I work with, um, I work with a number of organizations, but I, I've been working a lot with the women's leadership group um, in, in one particular company. And when, uh, right when the Harvey Weinstein story came out, because, um, and also my, um, one of my really good friends um, is one of the women in, in the New Yorker article against um, Leslie Moonves from CBS. Wow. Um, so I've very, got a lot of deep personal knowledge about what's been going on with these stories. Um, and, um, and one of the, I was carpooling with uh, a couple of the ladies from this organization up to the location where we were doing the training. And we started talking about the Harvey Weinstein um, uh, thing that had, had recently come out. 
And we walked onto the elevator and we started just sharing, well, who was your Harvey Weinstein? And we all shared stories there. And I looked over and there was a, a man in the corner of the elevator just trying to make himself smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> inside of the elevator. Um, but he heard some really interesting things. And you know, one of the women shared that, that she hasn't worn dresses or skirts to work in 10 years because of the harassment that she's faced. Um, so I think that it's, it's this, um, it's always been there. Men have known that it's always been there. Men know what the rules are, but they're afraid of perception. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, what, what I've been working toward with the men that I work with is um, to understand, and, and all of the work that I've been doing with companies um, started out of this whole movement where uh, I was talking with one of the, the women at, um, at UCSD where I teach, and I said, you know, we all have those compliance, sexual harassment compliance trainings. We all know how to answer the questions properly at the quiz mm -hmm. that's at the end of the online training session, right. which most companies do. Um, but do we know, but do, but do they know why? Mm -hmm. Do men know why that's not okay to do that? And what I wanted to do was to create a, a space where we could talk about why. Why is it inappropriate to talk about a woman's appearance um, at, at work? What's behind that? Um, why, you know, when, when the story that my, my friend shared in the New Yorker article on Les Moonves, everybody was just really shocked at um, her story because she was just going in there to do her job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if she were a man, she could have continued to do that job without any sort of interference um, and, and, that's the wonderful thing that's coming out about this in this movement is that men are realizing now that women don't just get to just do the job. We have to face all of these other things um, that get in our way while we're just trying to do the job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and now, um, you know, really having an open conversation about, well, you know, from the training that you've had to do in the past that it's not okay to do this. Now we're here to talk about why it's not okay to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's all about creating space to have that conversation. Um, I find that mo most of the men that I work with want to do the right thing. They want to bring more women into their workplaces. They want to have uh, an environment that, that makes women feel like their contributions are welcome. They just don't know how to function in a space that, that, um, uh, without being afraid of tripping over something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is um, what we need to do now is figure out, well, what now? Right. Right. How do we what, move forward? What now after me too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those of you that, that have joined us as, um, as participants today, please, if you've got anything you want to add, something you want to throw in or a question for our special guests, please feel free to, to, you know, speak up. We want to hear what everyone's experience has been. Tiffany, how about you? What, what would you say you're seeing out there as far as the, the impact of Me Too or, or Time's Up or uh, just the conversation around some of these things? You know, what I'm really seeing is a lot of overwhelmingness and fear where, you know, with, with, with what I'm trying to do, it's already kind of making people look at things differently, but I think they're so overwhelmed about the amount of press and marketing and focus on the gender piece um, that it's almost suffocating all the other efforts. Yeah. And, and I don't think, you know, that's not saying it shouldn't be done or any downplaying any of the amazing things that have happened because of those movements, but because they are so high in the media, um, they're getting the attention without, like I said before, people looking at it correctly. It's almost like the cup is full. You mm -hmm. can't add another thing on to me that I need to be doing right. You know, I, I can't handle it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's almost creating a roadblock of, of, you know, like I said, people like Rebecca said, you know, people don't know how to act. People don't know what to say. And, and now I want to add in this as a people with autism in here who may say the wrong things or that you have to manage differently. They're like, I'm just, you know, I'm still just figuring out how I'm supposed to talk to the girl who works with me, you know, or, you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah, yeah. there's so overwhelmed right now. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's in my case for, for bringing in these different movements in, it's definitely creating a, um, a difficulty for me because of the amount of uh, publicity, but you know, in the long run, I think it's going to benefit the movements, uh, but that's what I'm seeing. Um, so it's going to have to work itself out. Um, and I think it's just, I, I need to be patient and know this 
Um, and that's why I always call this as a long sales process mm -hmm. of education because, you know, people need to heal from all that's been come, come out lately in the media before they're really willing to uh, refresh their outlook on all of the workplace and culture and really how we're going to put all these different things, the aging population, the diversity, I mean, excuse me, the disabilities, the autism, the women, all of it together to make sense of it. Um, it's just going to take a little bit of time to get to that place. Hmm. That's an interesting point that you raised because uh, I, I was talking to a friend that that does DNI at one of the tech companies here in the Bay Area, and um, and we were specifically talking about wage inequity, uh, which is kind of a a big interest of mine, and and she said kind of of what you said, Tiffany, that. Uh, you know what's the right thing to do, but now there's all these things layered on top of it. You know, you, you start trying to have a more diverse workplace, but then that opens up the fact that we don't have equal pay across all of these things. And we don't necessarily have equal opportunity across different uh, minority groups. And, oh my gosh, what do we do with the disabled? You know, that, or the, the um, differently abled, you know, whatever is the, the, the terminology that we want to use, but um, it is, it's just, it's, it's just another thing. It's another thing to consider. So I can see why you would say people get fatigued and overwhelmed, you know, with it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> but I think that goes along with what, you know, Tracy brought up about all the um, reporting requirements. So those of you who are, aren't in HR, there are so many reporting requirements that you need to do a as an organization to meet, you know, like four different departments. Did you hire this? Do you selection? Do you have this amount of people from your pool? And these, I mean, you could go crazy just trying to, to make those things that are supposedly black and white and then trying to mix it all together and make a company work on top of it. It's, I mean, it's, it's almost like, it's ridiculous. It really needs to be simplified. Um, so it's overwhelming for any HR manager trying to make, you know, this alphabet soup, the right combination of letters and numbers. Yeah. Um, I, I feel for people that are just do that. And I, I, I think it's hard right now to be in an HR role or to be an organizational role and trying to make all these different things happy, you know, the government plus the society and everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, what about millennials? What's the, what are we seeing that they're bringing different to the workplace? Is there any impact that they're bringing into the workplace or new demands or a new mindset maybe um, of what's going on? Yeah, absolutely, uh, is the answer to that question. Um, I mean, I, um, I, there, I, I work with some other um, trainers who are, who are far more well-versed and specific, uh, specifically working with, with um, millennials, um, millennials and Gen Xers and baby boomers and how they work together. But from, from my experience, um, having taught in the university for, system for a very long time and to have seen this millennial generation grow um, through, through that work, what I have found is that they are much more, um, they are much more open-minded uh, to diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, they are much less uh, uh, judgmental of, of things like um, religion, gender, uh, gender nonconformity, race, um, all different kinds of, of, of things that, that make up identity. Um, they very much embrace difference um, in general, again, broad sweeping terms. Um, and they also don't particularly care for this, the, the traditional form of work. They like to have a lot more freedom and flexibility. Um, they, they will work ridiculously hard, but they want to be able to do it on their own terms. Uh, and I do a, a course on collaboration, and um, one of the statistics that we have in there is that that is, I think, the one of the leading um, things that millennials look for in an organization that they are planning to join is how well can they collaborate with other people, and they are really looking for diversity in collaboration. So I think that there's a fantastic opportunity with the millennials um, sort of taking over the workforce, I think, in the next, one of the statistics I've read is in the next five or 10 years, they're going to make up 75% of the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things is, is that most of them already understand the importance of what we're all here talking about. It's then how do you help them create, um, first of all, a structure um, for, for celebrating that diversity, 
uh, and also how do you help them to get the buy-in of the older generations that might not necessarily be open to this new way of approaching work. Mm -hmm. um, from, from my experience, the biggest challenge, um, because I also have a, a, a Gen X brother who manages a whole team of millennials and shares with me his frustrations of it all the time, uh, <laughs> that, that, um, that, the, that the primary difference there is just in how they approach work um, and what that means to them. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of diversity and inclusion, I think the millennials are, are, are a much easier uh, audience to, to have this conversation with than, than older generations. Mm -hmm. um, again, I always like to say with an asterisk, broad sweeping generalization. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not true yeah. of all of them. Yeah. And I think you're right, Rebecca. I mean, I think you said that very eloquently. And um, I know from my perspective with coming in with the diversity being disabilities and autism, because there's been such a high um, occurrence of it, it's it's not that abnormal for them to want to work with people. But what's really benefited my movement is um, is the fact that the people in the millennial generation want a company that is doing something for other people. They want a giving organization. So if you can get that part in the value proposition of you're going to have all these employees, they're millennials, this is what's important to them. You need to be proactive because this is going to, this is the kind of environment they want to be. So that to me is a huge selling point uh, for taking on, you know, different populations. Um, I, I think it's amazing what they can do. And, and even I have two teenagers and, and like we're, we're not millennials by one year. <laughs> so <laughs> like one year, like, so I just turned 18, but, um, their understanding, I mean, they go to a Catholic school, so there's a certain education they're getting, but yeah. their understanding of all the different, um, you know, sexes and, and approaches, and it, 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 it humbles me because they really do have a different perspective of the world and so much more accepting of people and understanding that, you know what, if that's they want to be, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think it's kind of a beautiful thing, even though it's just way different from everything that we grew up doing. Um, I don't know. That's, yeah. that's my two cents. Yeah. Yeah. And Tracy, I think no, that, kind of, all... that feeds into, to your hiring pool as well, right? You know, if you, it, it is a differentiator for the organization. If you're able to say that this is, this is our mindset, this is what we embrace and that it seems to me, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, would increase your talent pool to draw from people would want to work for that organization. Absolutely. I mean, it definitely would um, increase individuals showing interest and wanting to, you know, join the organization, refer other like-minded people, their friends, family as well. Um, and then, you know, that's why you see certain organizations that really just have a great diversity and inclusion culture. And a lot of it is millennials are looking for, um, empowerment and they want an authentic environment mm -hmm. and they appreciate that individuality and so when you have that environment that's going to attract those people with that mindset and um, they do see the value of how that can contribute also to the growth of the organization because you see millennials desiring you know career advancement and you know company growth and that's all very exciting for them so having a workforce that supports that and they can really stand behind that and embrace it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, with some, some things that are newer and with more publicity, such as, you know, single, single use bathrooms, you know, all gender bath restrooms and, um, you know, even seeing individuals going through gender transition in the workforce. Um, those are things that we haven't, had as visible in the past and I find it's those are particular areas where people are afraid they don't want to misstep or say the wrong thing and it's concerning to them because if they have someone that they're working with it's in that situation they aren't always comfortable asking the questions but sometimes being curious and showing respect by asking the individual how would you like us to refer to you do you want us to say he or she? Um, just being mindful of what their preferences are um, can go a long way to being able to treat the person the way that they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm going into to do it, um, working with um, Apple on doing some training and on the emails um, on their their um, little signature on their email. It has their preferred pronouns. Uh, listed mm. uh, right next to all of their contact information, um, which I thought was fantastic, but they, they were, I'm clearly coming in there because they have more work to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, even though they have those pronouns, they're bringing me in because they have an all male engineering team and they're about to hire some women and they need to make sure that those women actually want to work there. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's something that I've been, I've been working with um, uh, a person who transitioned from male to female a couple of years ago, and I've worked with her through her, her whole transition. And, and we approached it from, um, because she's a, a scientist who works in the biotech field, um, I worked with her to actually do her presentation to her company when she was um, telling them what was going to happen um, and um, giving them an opportunity to ask those kinds of questions. And so I worked with her on, on, uh, on the, I think for about seven or eight months on the speech before she told her company uh, that she was making the transition. And I, I had a couple of friendly test audiences come in and I said, hit her with any question that pops into your head. This is, this is a safe space for her to, to hear that question and to think about how she wants to respond to it. And I could tell that they were still holding back because they weren't sure. And then finally, one of them privately came up to her um, afterwards and asked, um, the question that was, I'm sure, on everybody's mind um, about what was ha going to happen with her marriage, um, <laughs> and um, and so she she was able to to have an opportunity to test run those questions, um, and uh, but not everybody in the trans community is has achieved that that kind of position. I'm working with her right now on some some leadership programs for for. Um, mostly for other transgender um, youth to, to help them to figure out how to be the, um, the more proactive um, person in that conversation uh, in their workplaces and, yeah. and how to have the confidence to, to help, um, help their supervisors figure out how to work with them in, in, in a very inclusive way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's so over, it overlaps so much with what we're trying to do in the autism community or disability community, which is, um, this is how I need to work. You know, my son got a job all on his own at Target, but I didn't say you need to tell him you have autism. You need to tell him when you give me instructions, I need them this way. When, you know, when I, you know, I need to know who's in charge to answer their questions. I mean, I think that's what we need to do with, with our youth, with our, you know, colleges, with everybody is we need to give them the tools to advocate for whatever their needs may be, you know, and it, it really goes to all across all that. So, I mean, I really like to focus on the colleges and let's look at the, the people in the colleges. I mean, you work with them, uh, Rebecca, but I go to the universities and say, let's talk about how we can empower people that are engineers who probably most of them, there's a lot probably that do fall in the neurodiverse population? How do we empower the women? How do we empower everybody to be able to talk about what we need to be successful in the workplace to be the best employee we can be? Yeah. And I mean, we, we, I mean, we talked earlier about how um, the gender um, issue is, is front and center right now and that that might be taking away from conversations about other, um, other diverse groups. But what I think is that what they all have in common is this shared um, uh, there's a there's a common denominator between um, working with everybody, and that is um, finding a space to be able to have um, empathy for one another and to understand an individual uh, experience and um, need and method of communicating. And you know, you can have two straight white forty five year old men, and they could be they are completely different people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that what all of these um, uh, uh, pieces that are coming uh, into into our front and center view about diversity are all stemming from the same space of of needing to to figure out how are we going to understand each other and work together um, mm -hmm. more um, empathetically and more effectively. Yes. And um, and then we can add the layers of of gender or sexual orientation or or um, you know wh whatever we want to onto that. But at the core of it all, I think, is finding a, a space where we can have these um, conversations with one another, where we can, uh, both from a, an individual employee level and from a company policy level, how do we create a space where 
uh, whether you are a woman um, or you are a millennial or you are someone with autism or you are somebody who um, who uh, um, speaks a different language or is hearing impaired, whatever your um, your difference is, is understanding um, that company wide, this is how we're going to engage with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and the elephant in the room. Yeah. I always say, if I was talking to a bunch of people and I said, we can't all be elephants in the room. Yes, I am white, <laughs> black, you're purple. Like we can't like skate around all these topics all the time because we're completely sticking ourselves in the mud and we're moving nowhere. So we need to be able to have those conversations. But once again, we're so fearful of calling somebody black when they want to be called African American. You know, I mean, things like that. It's, it's, or I'm a woman. Yes, I'm a woman. I'm a mom. That is who I am. And I bring all those experiences with me to this workplace. And yes. that's what makes me amazing. You know, yes. and, and it's really embracing that. Yeah, I love so, that. And, you know, the, um, I am going to go there for just a minute. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I've really been dismayed uh, in in the last year or so. I guess with um, it feels like in in our uh, public discourse we have taken a step back. We have taken a 20, 30, 40 year step back to where we're hearing things said in the media. We're hearing things said on the street that you know that I I think most of us or many of us, well, not most, I mean, many of us, I guess, uh, had hoped we're long dead, you know? So uh, I, I have problems when I encounter that, like, just like, how can that mindset still exist? So do we need some focus on that within our organizations to say this, this may be acceptable out somewhere in this, this realm of discourse, but here in this organization, this is not acceptable. And is that going to be something that helps stem the tide of, of this ridiculous backlash? I mean, what I'm experiencing in the organizations that I go into um, is that that and this is just the experience of the people that I've worked with is that 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 has that discourse has absolutely nothing to do with business um, that for them to be profitable for them to to be successful that they they there is a total awareness that that rhetoric is ridiculous and unacceptable it doesn't mean that there aren't people within the organization that that have those um, those viewpoints I do think that we are living in a moment where um, uh, that that worldview is being given a megaphone um, mm -hmm. where perhaps not as many people actually feel that way or people are, um, are embracing that, that point of view out of a space of fear. Um, and then it's being amplified through social media and through people saying it um, <laughs> out loud um, with a very vast um, audience listening to them. Right. Um, but the organizations that I work with understand that that is just not an acceptable way of do doing business by allowing those, that, that, that rhetoric to, to take hold. And, and I, I think it, it might be just the, the, the clients that I tend to work with um, uh, are global and know that they they can't function and, and be profitable if, if, um, if they, allow any of that kind of conversation to happen but um but it is there i almost feel at the moment like there's that there's almost a need to to ignore that that that's not part of the, the world of business that that's separate that that's a different world um a different space that that, that our, our brains occupy is the awareness of that part of the world mm -hmm. um but that 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 might just be very specific to the clients that i work with which is a lot of um, people in the sciences and in um high tech and in um and companies that are global that understand that their company would be dead in the water if they allowed any snippet of of that kind of um thinking to enter into their their workforce mm -hmm. i certainly hope it's a business uh uh imperative to not behave that way <laughs> yeah yeah well i think that we're seeing I a think lot of for the yeah for the for the really blatant 
type, kind of behavior, I see that there's definitely um, zero tolerance for that and organizations recognize they need to stand by their values and take action when there is something egregious that's occurred or even things that, you know, really from even from a leadership perspective, if it's inappropriate, I mean, doing the right thing really takes a stand and shows that your values are important important and you're standing by them. And I think that's a testament to the culture of the company. Um, what I still see happening though is there are situations where it's the nuanced behavior. It's not the blatant um, overt type of um, scenario. It's something subtle or a comment or a look or um, you know something physical, um, the way that maybe that they treated the person or looked at them that makes someone uncomfortable and a lot of women are still very very reluctant to come forward they don't even want anything to go on record and sometimes you find out about it by accident and the point is that we have to tell them if we don't take action this could be repeated it can happen to someone else and the person needs to be called on their behavior um, but I still see that as a big challenge organizationally um, across multiple companies that um, individuals are not comfortable coming forward. Yeah. Nice. Good point. Good point. Well, this is a great conversation, you guys. This is just has just been so rich. Um, any last thoughts that any of you have or any of you that have joined us online um, Maybe what's your experience been? What have you seen in your workplace or um, something that you would like to, to share? I have a question for Tiffany. Yep. So in your work with people with dis disabilities, I was just watching a program recently and it was showing um, a baby that was born with some deformities. Um, and this is, I'm talking back um, when, back in time when they were first discovering that certain drugs were creating babies with deformities and all of this. And so it was kind of new where this, these disabilities were ha happening and the emotional impact that it had on, of course, you know, the mother, the parents, but the one particular in this show with this, the father had such a diverse reaction to this child's deformity. It was perfect fine um she grew into uh thinking normal child she just had um i forget the drug but um stubbed hands and legs and uh he was so overcome with this emotional sadness seeing his own child do you do you have an educational piece for people i think it's human nature when they see people with disabilities in anywhere out and about this sadness or diverse reaction to wanting to be even around these people? I mean, is there a way you overcome that piece of human nature? Well, you know, two different points of what you said is first from the father going through that process, usually a child or a family that goes through something like that. For example, when my husband Tom and I, Jake got diagnosed with autism, we had to go through a grieving process and you have these dreams and ideas in your head of what your child is going to be able to do. And you really compare them to what your life was because that's your reference point. Uh, we had to kind of let that go. He's nothing like my husband was as a, an 18 year old. I mean, and, and that's, that's kind of one issue itself is, you know, the parents that can move forward and deal with their uh, processing these emotions, then they become a better advocate for their child and enable them to, you know, live great lives independently. But when it comes to the overall, you know, helping people with disability, it's really the success stories that are going to change it. It's, it's going to, you know, the, the local store and seeing the person who's got, you know, stumped hands and legs, doing their job, doing great, communicating like a normal person, um, those kinds of successes and, and having more access to it in the everyday world is, is what's going to change things. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and that's, once again, it's, it's just merging it in. So it's not so foreign. Um, I think there's always going to be people that are naive and it's going to take a longer time to educate or they could have had a bad experience. I mean, there wasn't a lot of behavioral therapy or other things going on in some of these generations and they could have had a really mean kid or a kid threatening to kill himself or something else. I mean, there's a lot of emotional disorders that go on with a, in a conjunction with a lot of these um, disabilities. 
Um, so they have a ex bad experience, so they need to move on from that too. So it is a really tricky question, but we do know that the more people see individuals with disabilities or autism or whatever else, maybe being successful, being a normal person, they realize that they are just people and they can see past the disability. But it's, you know, it's, it really, it's, it's a lot of how you were raised. Mm -hmm, and right. it, some people it's going to take a lot more to break down those barriers than others. Good question. So when you approach employers that are looking to partner and hire, um, do you come up against that at all? I mean, that, that emotional part of, I want to help, but how do I help? I don't know how to help. There's so much fear. I've had, um, yeah. I've gone in to talk to employers after they've brought on, you know, one person with the assistance of a support agency to ask, answer questions that they were afraid to ask. Mm. The questions were really so simple, but it was just the fear of getting it wrong. There's the fear of saying the wrong thing. There's a fear of, of doing something. And that fear keeps us from actually embracing the individual. Um, I had questions, you know, that were, once again, they were just really simple questions, but it was, it's breaking down those barriers that they're just people. Right. Just you know, just with what we're talking about with you know? everything. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. you see somebody, you know, in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. what's their legs have to do with anything? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you really have to think about it. And, um, you know, with autism, which, you know, is close to my heart, um, it's so di different for every single person. Yeah. You know, I actually was at a, um, autism at work at Microsoft and this guy came up to me and he was just swaying side to side. He had earphones on um, and just kind of blurted out something at me. And, and I realized he had said I, I had posted um, on one of his LinkedIn things, something really positive. And so we decided to, to you know, connect. We connected through email. The guy's the most elegant writer, you know, that I've ever, wow. ever in my life had the opportunity to interact with. But he cannot verbalize it. Yes. And it yeah. just is one, it was one of those, I mean, I, I do this every day, but one of those, I was like, oh, wow. yeah. hell, like yeah. this is, this guy is so amazing. So I keep pushing on his writing out there. So even for me, it's sometimes it's like, well, the, the appearance doesn't always match what's going on inside. Yeah, I know. And I've, I've, I, you know, about my niece, my niece has autism and I just know when I see her little face, there's so much going on inside there. She just can't verbalize it. So she has that little device where she can push a button and it's for her. So yeah. we're teaching her that. So hopefully that she can communicate with us a little more. That's great. Cause then her frustration level will go down and she'll be much yeah. happier. Well, I think that, you know, what you said a second ago, Tiffany, about the more exposure we have to differences, right? The better we are, you know, I mean, the, the more exposure we have to people who are not like us to situations that are not like us, the better, people that we become you know and and that's really i think the the positive message of of trying to achieve diversity and inclusion making a place for everybody making a place for everybody's talent and our workforce only benefits from that and our country benefits from that and the world benefits from that you know so i uh I think this has just been a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful to the three of you for being willing to be here and be brave and share your stories. And for those of you that, that joined us and um, participated in this conversation, I just, I'm just so grateful for all of you. And, and thank you again for being with us. Uh, be sure to watch for our other online forums because these are all designed for, for you, you know, the busy professional, there's something for everybody, whether you're looking for, you know, a deep dive into something, you know, just really interesting and heart wrenching and thought provoking, you know, like, like this program, or you're looking for uh, just additional data and information about how to do things better. You know, we have something for you. So we hope that you will connect with us at Connected Women of Influence. Let us know how we can help you, see how you can become a part of all of us. And again, thanks so much, Rebecca, uh, Tiffany, and Tracy. Thanks so much for being here and, and being willing to share your hearts with us. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thanks right, so buddy. much. Good talk with you. Bye now. Bye. 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 Have a good evening. Bye.